The sermon text this morning is taken from Hebrews chapter 9. Hebrews chapter 9, beginning at verse 19. These are the words of the living God. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament, which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Let's pray. Father, we come now to your living word, and we ask you to open our eyes so that we, we might see wonderful things. In particular, we ask you to enable us to see Jesus crowned with glory and honor at your right hand, and seeing him make us bold and courageous. And we ask for this boldly, in the name of Jesus, and amen. amen. The ascension of Jesus is one of the key glories of the gospel. The ascension of Jesus is one of the key glories of the gospel, and it really is part of the good news. But I think sometimes we, we struggle with that. Uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's a good shorthand to say, what's the gospel? Say Jesus was crucified for sins and raised from the dead. We get, we get the crucifixion and the resurrection, and that's at the center of it, and it's a good shorthand. It really is. But if you have any more time than that, it ought to be an instinct to you to say, and then he ascended into heaven. That ought to be part of what you think of as the gospel. He, he was crucified for sin, he rose from the dead, and then he ascended into heaven. But the, maybe one of the reasons why we don't always go right there is because it's, we have mixed feelings about it. <laughs> he, he was crucified for sinners, he was raised from the dead, and then he left. <laughs> was that really the best idea? Was that really what you should have done? And, and, we, and we, we, we have mixed feelings about it. We think, yes, the, the gospel is glorious, the, the crucifixion of Jesus is glorious, the resurrection of Jesus is glorious, but we maybe have pause, but, but is the ascension that glorious? I mean, he had to go somewhere, I suppose. I guess he went to heaven. But we don't think naturally that it's part of the good news, that when you're sharing the gospel with someone who doesn't know the Lord, when you're, when you're telling someone what it means uh, that, that you're a Christian, that you follow Jesus, it, it, does it roll off your tongue like that? You say, he was crucified for my sins. He rose from the dead, conquering sin, death, and the devil, and then he ascended into heaven. Isn't that good news? Our conquering king is our high priest and he has gone ahead of us, appearing in God's presence for us. And this really is good news. And this text in particular points us to why. You might say that the, the doctrine of the ascension, this doctrine in particular, is what makes Christians bold and courageous. It's one of the centerpieces, one of the central aspects of the gospel that drives Christians to be bold and courageous, to be fearless. We might say the ascension is the Christian doctrine of dominion. The ascension is the Christian doctrine of dominion. So let's look at this text, Hebrews 9, together, verse by verse, and explain why. Remember that from the first time God confronted sin in the world, it has always been accompanied with blood. Since the first time God confronted sin in the world, it's always been confronted, it's always been accompanied by blood. Remember Genesis 3, you have that first sin, Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit, they have disobeyed God, immediately they know that they're naked, they're shamed, they begin trying to cover themselves up, they hide in the bushes from God, God comes and confronts the sin. He declares curses 
on that sin. But then he clothes them. He clothes them, the text says, with skins, and that means those skins were taken from animals, which means even there in that first confrontation of sin in the history of the world, blood was involved. Those animals were killed. Their skins were peeled off them, turned into clothes for Adam and Eve. So from the time God first confronted sin in the world, it's been accompanied with blood. So when Moses renewed covenant with God's people at Sinai, everyone and everything was sprinkled with blood for the remission of sins. We see this in our text from verses 19 to 22. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats, uh, calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, this is the blood of the covenant, which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood the tabernacle, all the vessels of the ministry, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. In this summary that, that Hebrews is, gives us, uh, it, it's combining a number of different cleansings. So there's the Exodus 24 covenant-making ceremony after the Ten Commandments and the law has been described. And Moses uh, comes down off the mountain, sacrifices are offered, and, and the, the altars and the people, it says, are sprinkled with blood uh, before the elders go back up and feast uh, with God in his presence. But some of the other things that it, it mentions, uh, goats, the sprinkling of water, scarlet wool, hyssop, um, and these things, that everything else that's sprinkled and cleansed, uh, he's drawing off of other cleansing rituals in the whole Old Covenant system. So you can see some of this in Leviticus 14, later in Leviticus 16 with the Day of Atonement as well. Now, what that earthly tabernacle pictured was heaven itself, Hebrew says. What the earthly tabernacle pictured was heaven itself and God's presence. And therefore, what that old covenant dedication and cleansing foretold, Hebrews said, Hebrew says, was the purification of the heavenly things in heaven with better sacrifices. That's verse 23. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Thus, it was necessary for Christ to ascend into heaven itself, the temple that's not made with hands, to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. That's verse 24. Now, there's a number of things going on in this text, a number of different directions that we could explore. But I think one of the most striking questions that might occur to you if you're thinking about this, so he just said, that the tabernacle and temple system, which the old covenant priests uh, sprinkled and cleansed constantly over and over again, and uh, in, in many different ways, was a picture of what needed to happen in the real heaven. If you think about that for a second, a question ought to occur to you. Wait, why does heaven need to be cleansed? Isn't heaven the clean place? Isn't heaven the spotless place? Isn't heaven the pure place where God dwells? Isn't heaven clean? I mean, of all the places, isn't, isn't heaven spotless? Isn't heaven clean? Why does he have to go to heaven and cleanse heaven? That's what, but that's what it says. It says that. It says that, that picture that you were seeing in the Old Covenant was a picture of what needed to happen in heaven, and it's what Jesus has done in his ascension. Well, I want to drive home that question. Why does heaven need to be cleansed? Why does the real heaven, the heaven where God dwells, why does it need to be cleansed? Well, we want to back up, first of all, zoom out, and remember how God made the world, the way the world actually is. Remember, in the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth, and therefore they are both places that God created side by side. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, which means that there's the earth, and we know that there's a firmament, that's day two, 
There's a sky. It's where the birds fly in front of and the stars are in. That's the firmament. But we also know that there's waters above the firmament and there's a heaven above there. What we sometimes refer to as the highest heaven or the third heaven. The heaven where God dwells. So in the beginning, God created not only earth, not only a space a universe, but he also created a place called heaven where he decided to live. He created heaven and earth. These are both places that he created side by side, intending for them to mingle and overlap. God created heaven and earth and he intended for them to mingle and overlap. What do I mean by this? Well, you can see glimpses of this throughout the Bible. Think of Enoch. Remember Enoch in the early chapters of Genesis, it says he walked with God and then he was not. What is that? He walked with God. Well, it reminds us, it should remind you of of when, remember Adam and Eve walked with God in the garden. Enoch had such a close relationship with God that he walked with God in, 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 in sort of this way in which heaven kind of broke into earth. He walked with God and then at some point, He just went with heaven. He went. He was not. Heaven and earth mingle. Heaven, you might say, sort of protrudes into earth at various points. It it sort of pokes through our earthly existence from time to time. So you see that with Enoch or some other examples. Uh, Maybe think of the burning bush, right? There's Moses out shepherding sheep. And all of a sudden he sees this bush on fire, but nothing's being consumed, no ash. It's just on fire. And then a voice is coming out of this this fiery bush and it informs him that he's standing on holy ground, right? Somehow heaven has sort of broken into earth in this place and he, and Moses sees sand and, and, you know, desert and wilderness, you know, Sinai wilderness. And God says, excuse me, you're standing on some of my heaven. Take off your shoes. Right? Heaven breaks in. It, it, it protrudes into earth. Or we see this, of course, with Elijah. Think of Elijah riding a heavenly fiery chariot. Right? We don't have fiery chariots that carry people in the air in this world. Right? <laughs> it came from somewhere else. It came from heaven. It broke in, it just crossed over, picked Elijah up and carried him away back into heaven. It crossed over and then broke back over. Elisha watched and there he was, there he went. Heaven and earth mingle. Heaven and earth are close. They they merge at points. Or think about the vision of the heavenly army surrounding Elisha and his servant. Remember Elisha and his servant, the, the, the armies have come up against them and Elisha's servant says, we're toast. What, what are we going to do? And Elisha says, what are you talking about? Lord, open his eyes so he can see. And Elisha's servant turns around and sees a whole mountainside filled with myriads of angelic forces, armies of angels surrounding them. And Elisha says, we have more than them. We're going to be fine. More are with us than with them. There's another moment where heaven was there. The heavenly armies were there. Heaven was right there in this world. Elisha's servant couldn't see it. We can't often see it, but from time to time, God reveals it or God gives vision to his people to see it. Heaven and earth mingle. Heaven and earth bleed together. They break in to one another. And of course, you might fast forward to uh, the transfiguration scene where Jesus appears on the mountain with Moses and Elijah and Moses and Elijah are there they're in their sort of shining heavenly existence, but there they are right on the mountain for the disciples to see. And of course, the ascension of Jesus itself. Jesus in his glorified, resurrected, but very human material body went up and a cloud covered him. And then he was in heaven. He broke through. He, he, the, the, the two go together. The two are side by side. The two mingle Together, heaven is not far away. Heaven is not far away. Heaven 
is near. Heaven is near, but that original unity and harmony of heaven and earth, the way that God created it to be, has been terribly strained by our sin. And because of our sin, in many ways, God has blocked it. In many ways, he's not made it possible for us to see it, not made it possible for us to cross over into it. It's been terribly strained by our sin. Thus, the ultimate goal is pictured in Revelation, in the imagery of the heavenly Jerusalem coming down out of heaven to earth and the dwelling place of God being with men again. That's Revelation 21 and 22. The heavenly Jerusalem, the new city coming down out of heaven such that the dwelling place of God is among men. The goal is reunion. The goal is for that original union and harmony to be restored completely and then more. Restored and then glorified. Heaven and earth reunified. You still might be asking, okay, wait. It doesn't really answer the question, why does heaven then need to be sprinkled clean. Oscar Wilde once told a story about a portrait, a cursed portrait of a man uh, that uh, it, the picture told the truth about him. It m- gave him miraculous long life, so he was going to live this long life, uh, but, it, but it really was a curse, and the, and the picture was going to tell the truth about how it was going with this guy. And so this, this man lives this miraculously young, uh, long life, remains young for many, many years, but the longer he lives, the more wicked he becomes. And as he becomes more and more wicked, the picture that he has hiding in this attic room back at home, and the more hideous it becomes, the more old and deformed the picture becomes. Now hold that image for a moment in your mind. On the Day of Atonement, In Leviticus 16, on the Day of Atonement, in the Old Covenant system, once a year, the priests would take two goats. One of them, uh, they, they would lay their hands on the head of the goat, and the sins of the people would be confessed over it, and it would be released into the wilderness. It's confessed, sins would be confessed over the head of one goat, it's released into the wilderness. The other goat, they would kill, and then the high priest would take the blood into the tabernacle. And it's really striking that it says what they're doing on the Day of Atonement. It, it, it kind of makes sense in a certain way. The first goat. Put your sins on the goat and send it away. And that's really is a glorious picture of what God does for us in the gospel. God takes our sins away and they're gone. They're lost forever. That's glory. That's glory. But the other goat is kind of striking. The other goat might be, strike us as sort of strange because the blood is taken into the tabernacle. It's sprinkled on all, the, on all the furniture. And then, of course, this is the one day a year where the high priest can go into the most holy place, the Holy of Holies, and he sprinkles blood there on the lid of the Ark of the Covenant. And it says that when the high priest does this, he's doing this in order to cleanse the tabernacle from all the uncleanness of the people. One goat takes the sins away that way. But the other thing that's being pictured is that God is cleansing his house in their midst from all the sins of the people. It says this in Leviticus 16, verse 16, and again in verse 19. The high priest is cleansing the house, the tabernacle, from all the sins of the people. Put this together. In other words, because heaven is not far off at all, because heaven is here, because we are near heaven, and because God in his mercy has drawn near, because he has bound himself in covenant to a sinful people, there is a sense in which our sinfulness stains God's glory and collects in heaven, just as it did in the tabernacle. That was the picture. The picture is God says, I've drawn near to you. I live with you. I live with you in the middle of your camp. And that means your sin, it's kind of getting on me. It's kind of fouling me, my presence. But that's a picture of reality. It's a picture of reality. There's a sense in which our sinfulness stains God's glory and collects in heaven. Kind of like the picture of Dorian Gray that Oscar Wilde told. And so it must be cleansed. 
Think about this. We live before God constantly. We live before God constantly. Where can you go from his presence? Nowhere. God is everywhere. God's presence is everywhere. Heaven touches earth everywhere. We don't see it. We don't always sense it, but God is there. God is there. There you are in your living room, right? And you're not alone. Your your living room actually opens up onto heaven. Your dining room opens up onto heaven. Your bedroom opens up onto heaven. Your truck cab opens onto heaven. Heaven's there. Heaven's all around us. God is with us constantly. And therefore, there we are with God sinning right in front of him, right in front of him, right in his presence, right in the holy place. Think about the fact that you're an image bearer. You bear the image of the living God. You're reflecting your father in heaven, the glorious king of the universe. You're reflecting him constantly, all the time, all day long. And there's a sense in which the reason why is because God is there upholding you all day long. God is there shining his face on you all day long so that all the atoms in your body don't just fly apart. He's he's upholding you all day long because he's there with you. You're in his presence constantly. And then what do we do? There in his presence constantly. We sin. We sin right there with him, right there with us. We lie about him what he is like with our sin. We snap at our wife and God is right there. God is there in our presence, in our midst. We are there in heaven with him, sinning. He is there giving us life as the great king and we're like insolent rebels, right? Think, think you know, there's all, you might maybe have that, those, those moments where you, know, you think you're alone. You think you're, you know, just, it's just you and your wife or it's just you and a friend. And all of a sudden you realize someone has been sitting there the whole time or somebody's right around the corner the whole time. And, you know, does your heart ever go down into your stomach? What did I say? Oh, oh, oh. Well, God is always there. You're, you're always in the house of the Lord. Heaven and earth are not far off. Heaven mingles with earth. They touch. We're always in the presence of God. And, and so in that sense, and that, as we, it's not just sin, that's bad, yes, but we're also sinning right there in front of him, right there in his living room, sinning, standing on his couch, sinning. That's what we're doing. That's what we're doing with our envy, with our bitterness, with our lusts, with our complaining. He gives, he gives, he gives, he keeps giving, he upholds it all. And then like Israel in the wilderness, we complain about all the magic bread. It's getting old. And we turn to idols. Well, I don't know, I guess guess this isn't really working out. I need something else to fulfill me. I'm just not feeling it. And God is there. God is here. God is upholding everything, giving us everything, every breath, every heartbeat, every good gift. And there we are, sinning right in his face. But God, in his great mercy, sent his only begotten son into the world to be the true tabernacle. That's what it says in in John 1, 14. It says that the word became flesh, and literally it says he tabernacled among us. He tabernacled among us. And if you're thinking like this, that means, wait, that means not only that he came near, it means not only that he came near to dwell with us, but it means he came near to collect up all our sin. He came to draw near to collect all our uncleanness because that's what the tabernacle did. He came to become that image where all our hideous sin might collect. He came to become that cursed picture of all our evil and greed. And this is why he said that when he was lifted up on the cross, he would be lifted up just like that hideous serpent and pierced. John 3, verse 14. 
I remember in the wilderness, the, the, the people of Israel complained, they fornicated, they committed all kinds of sins. And God sent these poisonous uh, serpents that bit them and they were dying by the thousands. And so God told Moses, take, take a picture of that. Take a picture of that thing that's poisoning them. Take a picture of that sin that's killing them and form it and put it pierced on a pole. Put it dead on a pole. Put it mangled on a pole. And then everyone who looks to that and sees their poison mangled there, dead there, will be healed. And Jesus said, that's what he came to do. Jesus came to be the tabernacle, to be the image. And he, he pictures us, but then they nailed him to a cross. They nailed him to a tree, beaten to a bloody pole, ugly, beaten beyond recognition. And God says, see your sin there. See your ugly, putrid sin there. See it nailed, see it bloody, see it dead. See it there. That's what God did in Christ. And so he was lifted up on the cross. He was lifted up like that hideous serpent pierced. But whereas Oscar Wilde's image only mocked and caused ultimate despair, Jesus rose from the dead on the third day and all our sin was gone forever. That's what he did. And if that wasn't enough, he ascended into heaven itself into the presence of the living God, appearing there in the presence of God for us. You see, this is, this is the thing. It's, it's that, it's that we, where our sin has happened, is, it's actually the worst of it isn't that we sinned here. The worst of it is that we sinned actually because of God's presence everywhere. We've been sinning in heaven all this time. Heaven and earth overlap. Heaven and earth mingle. And so you've been, it's like you tracked in stuff and you can, you, when you track it in, in your house, well, you get a mop and you clean it up. But how do you clean heaven? How do you get there where you offended? The, the worst offense happened there. The worst offense happened in heaven. The worst offense happened before your maker, before your God. How do you get there? How do you go make it right there? The answer is Jesus. Jesus says, I'll go for you. I will go to heaven ahead of you and I will speak on your behalf. I will stand there for you and I will make it right there for you. A number of years ago, my, uh, my mom's dad died when I was about nine or 10. And um, one of my last memories, which was, used, was, was really awful at the time, um, was I, last, one of the last times I saw him, I was probably seven or eight years old. He took me and other grandkids to the toy store and he wanted to buy us toys. And a great grandpa, you know, good grandpa thing to do. So he took us to the toy store, Toys R Us or something like this, said, pick out a toy. And I went around and I found a microscope. And man, I wanted that microscope. And I took the microscope to my grandpa and he said, no, I don't want to get that for you. <laughs> he said, I want, pick out a toy. And I, I really want this microscope. No, I want to get you a toy. Go pick out a toy. So I finally went out and picked out a toy, but I was mad. I wanted that microscope, darn it. And then I, we left, and I was still mad at my grandpa. And then about a year later, he died. And I remember, like, for months, thinking, oh, no. I can't get to him now. He's gone. How do you get to him now? How do you go make that right? And I knew I needed to. I knew it was wrong. And at some point, I remember just praying and saying, Lord, tell Grandpa, please forgive me. And I know he did. I know he did. Because he's there. He's there. The, the worst thing isn't your sin here. The worst thing isn't your sin here. The worst thing is your sin there. That you've been sinning in the presence of a holy God. You've been sinning in the presence of a God whose goodness and love and truth and holiness and everything that's good. How are you going to get there? The good news of the gospel is that Jesus has gone there for us. He was crucified for our sins. He rose from the dead and he said, I know where it hurts the most. I know where it's broken the most. It's in heaven. And so I'm going there for you. I'm going to make it right there for you. I'm going to stand there. I'm going to make everything clean there for you. That's the good news of the ascended Jesus, that he's gone there for us to make it all right, 
to do what we can't do, to go where we can't go yet, and to make it safe for us to get there. In the very next chapter in Hebrews 10, it says that because of the blood of Jesus, we enter the Holy of Holies with boldness. Because of the blood of Jesus, we go into the Holy of Holies with boldness. But notice, this isn't a dark tent in a desert or some building in the Middle East. The Holy of Holies is talking about is the actual Holy of Holies. It's the actual one in heaven where God dwells. He says, we go in there by the blood of Jesus with boldness. We go in there into the actual highest heaven with boldness because of the blood of Jesus, because he is our high priest. That's Hebrews 10, 19 and 20. We draw near, we draw near now, today in worship and any day with true hearts, with full assurance of faith, because our hearts have been sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. He sprinkled our hearts clean from heaven. He sprinkles us clean. And notice this, you've got, you've got both, there's, there's two problems really two problems. One of them is how do we get to heaven where we've made a mess? We've tracked stuff in, we've, we've, we've completely fouled up the place, but we can't see it and we don't know where it is and we don't know how to get there. Well, part of the answer of the ascension is Jesus goes there for us and he cleanses it for us. He makes it clean for us. He makes it right for us there where we can't go yet, where we can't see. But the, there's a flip side. The flip side is also that we've got a heart problem. We've got a sin problem in our hearts. And I, how do you get there? How do you get to that place where that guilt is? How do you get to that place where that shame is? How do you get to that place where it, it gnaws at you? How do you get there? None of us can get to it. None of us can get at it. All, all, the, all the offers that we have out there are just, they're just materialistic offers. This is why, you know, the, the crazy world we live in, you know, they, they, they give these just, just completely mind-numbing explanations of why people do, you know, evil things. Well, the reason why this, this kid, you know, shot up this school or whatever was uh, because they didn't have as much money when they were younger, they were really poor. Or, you know, they didn't have access to the same things. And of course, there are material factors involved, but it doesn't explain the evil. It doesn't explain where that evil comes from. It doesn't explain the way it, we feel it and we know it in our own hearts. And, you, and, the, and so the question is, well, how, how do you get in there? Well, it's the same answer. Jesus, who went to heaven to get where we can't get, from heaven cleanses in us what we can't get at. From heaven, he cleanses our hearts. He sprinkles our hearts clean from an evil conscience. Hebrews 10, verse 21. So how are our hearts Sprinkled clean. Jesus is in heaven, and one of the things our text says is that he's sprinkling everything clean. He's sprinkling everything clean. How do we get our hearts sprinkled clean? First and fundamentally, by agreeing with God that you're a sinner in need of his great mercy. First and fundamentally, surrender. Recognize what you've been doing. You live in God's world. He's here. He made this place. He's in every corner of it. There's no place in this whole universe you can go to hide from the living God. You've been living in his world. And you've either been living in his world under his blessing, or you've been fighting him. Right? The, first, the first and fundamental answer is to have your heart cleansed, to have your heart sprinkled clean, is by agreeing with God that you're a sinner in need of his great mercy. You've been living in his world and you've been defying him. You've been living in his world and you've been spitting in his face. You've been living in his world as a rebel. So surrender, get on your knees, surrender, lay down your arms and tell God, I'm sorry. Tell him, be converted, turn around, stop fighting. Come, come to the Lord, come to him, get on your knees and cry out and say to him, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I've been living in your world and I haven't lived in it in obedience to you. Surrender, get on your knees, be converted and you will be made clean. Your heart will be washed clean. You'll be given a new heart. That's conversion. That's the first way. That's the first way you have your heart sprinkled clean. And then 
some of you say, well, I, I did that. I know what that's like. I remember that. That happened to me. I'm converted. I know I have a new heart. I know, but I keep sinning. I keep sinning. And, and, it, and, and then, well, then the answer is we also have in Scripture. Confess your sins to God and anyone you've sinned against. The promise of Scripture is that if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's the promise. Confess your sins to God. Confess your sins to your neighbor, your wife, your husband, your children, your parents, your teacher, your, your coworker, your employer, your employee. Confess your sins. Confess your sins to God and whoever you've wronged. And the promise of God is that he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. This is also how you sprinkle your heart clean again. It's how Jesus sprinkles your heart clean again. It's by the blood of Jesus, and he can get in there, and he promises to do it if you ask him. If you ask him to do it, he will make you clean. All of this means that part of what Jesus is cleansing in heaven, follow me closely here, part of what Jesus is cleansing in heaven is us. He went to heaven to cleanse heaven, to cleanse all the heavenly places. We don't know everything that that entails, but he's in heaven cleansing the heavenly places, this place called heaven. But part of what he's cleansing is us because we're told in scripture that that's where we are seated in him. Ephesians 2.6 says that we have been seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. By faith, we're in two places. By faith, we walk in this world. We gather here for worship. But by faith, we're also in the heavenly places. By faith, we're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. And so part of what Jesus is cleansing is us. This also means that heaven and earth have been reunited. Heaven and earth have been reunited in principle by the death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. Heaven and earth overlap even more than ever. They, they overlap even more. Remember, when Jesus was crucified, when he died, when he cried out, it was finished, and he breathed out his last, it says that in the temple, the curtain was torn, and it was torn from top to bottom, which incidentally means it was torn from the top, which means God did it. God tore it open and said, come. He tore it open. He broke it open and said, come. He's putting things back together. He's putting heaven and earth back together. This is what Stephen saw when he was being stoned. Stephen, the first martyr, they're chucking rocks at this guy. And he looks up and says, I see heaven opened. And I see Jesus, the son of man, sitting at the father's right hand. You know, he's sitting there in front of us all, all the time. Stephen had the gift of seeing it right in front of him. But it's there all the time. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father all the time in front of us all. Stephen saw it. John saw it in his vision of Revelation. We don't know exactly what parts of this creation will be in the resurrection, but we ought to be a lot more hopeful than we usually are. There's parts of heaven that we haven't, we haven't seen yet, and we're going to get to see those one day. But there's also parts of this world. They're, they're coming back together. Remember, the new Jerusalem's coming down out of earth, uh, out of heaven to earth. They're, they're coming back together. They're being sewn back together. So we ought to be thinking, I wonder what parts of this world will be in heaven. How about the burning bush? I think the burning bush should be in heaven. Let's, I, I'm, I'm assuming God is somehow going to raise that up, put that back together. This is the burning bush. What else is going to be there from this world? Our bodies, we, we believe in the resurrection of the body. Jesus ascended in his body, and this is why we plant our bodies in the ground. They're, they're seed. We, we plant our bodies in the ground. When, when, a, when a brother or sister dies, we put them in the ground in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection of the body, that we will meet again. Jesus in heaven has scars, it says, on his hands. What scars are you looking forward to seeing in your glorified body? I mean, some of them we're hoping are going to be gone but I think some of them will be glory scars. Remember what God did there? Remember what God did then? Isn't that glorious? Jesus has scars. We're going to have bodies like his. What else is going to be in heaven? God is, lots of this world is going to be in heaven. Lots of this world is going to be in heaven, or better, lots of this world is being transfigured into heaven. Remember it says in Revelation that the nations bring their treasures into the heavenly Jerusalem. What treasures do you think the nations are going to bring? 
right? super spiritual people, you know, say love and joy. Yes, bring your love and joy. But treasure is stuff. What treasure is, are the nations going to bring into the new Jerusalem? What treasure? What are the best things that the nations are going to bring? I, I think America should bring football, Texas barbecue, and Glacier National Park. Just to start. Some of the best things. But what else? What else? Where, where's the glory of God? Where do you see it? I remember driving down to Wallawa one time. I, mean, I think it was the first time, northeastern Oregon. And you, you hear about the, the natives worshiping their gods down in this valley surrounded by mountains. And you drive in and you think, yeah, <laughs> yeah, God's here. Absolutely, God is here. Right? The, we're to bring our treasures into the new Jerusalem. We do not yet see all things under the feet of Jesus. We don't yet see all the things and how they fit together with heaven. We don't yet see that. But Hebrews 2 says, but we, we see Jesus crowned with glory and honor. We don't yet see it all put together, but we see Jesus. We don't yet see it all, but we see Jesus crowned with glory and honor at the Father's right hand. And since we have this full assurance, this boldness, we are not afraid of death, sin, Satan, or any enemy at all. And we work to take captive everything to the obedience of Christ. We bring it to him boldly. We say, how about this, Lord? And he sprinkles it clean, or maybe he says, nah, I got something better. But we bring everything to him. We bring it all to him for him to cleanse. And since Christ is cleansing everything in heaven, and we are seated in the heavenly places, we are to bring everything to him in dominion. Whatever it is that you do, whatever it is that God's called you to do, bring it to Christ. Bring it to him for him to sprinkle it. Bring it to him. Bring it all to him for him to make it clean. I want to close with a quote that a friend of mine posted on Ascension Day just a couple of days ago. We're celebrating it this morning. This is from Martin Luther on the Ascension, and it's really glorious. He says, my Lord Jesus Christ is Lord over death, Satan, sin, righteousness, body, life, foes, and friends. What shall I fear? For while my enemies stand before my very door and plan to slay me, my faith reasons thus. Christ is ascended into heaven and become Lord over all creatures. Hence my enemies too must be subject to him and thus it is not in their power to do me any harm. I challenge them to raise a finger against me or to injure a hair of my head against the will of my Lord Jesus Christ. When faith grasps and stands upon this article, the ascension, it stands firm and waxes bold and defiant. So as even to say, if my Lord so wills that they, my enemies, slay me, blessed am I, I gladly depart. Thus you will see that he is ascended into heaven, not to remain in indifference, but to exercise dominion and all for our good, to afford us comfort and joy. Our Father, we ask you to assure us of your peace, the peace that Christ has won with for us with you, and make us bold to take dominion in whatever way you've called us to. Drive away all fear and worry. Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, crowned with glory and honor, who is putting all things under his feet. Father, we ask for this in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, singing. In Colossians 3, verse 14, it says, And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. The ESV uses the word harmony there in that verse and a couple other places to describe what our lives together are to be like in the covenant community. Elsewhere, the King James translates the word harmony as having the same mind, and here it's translated as the bond of perfection. But harmony actually is a good way to translate it, since harmony describes different lines of music that intertwine and glorify and enhance one another. But in order to harmonize, you really have to listen both to your part and to the other parts around you. And this really is a great picture of Christian community. We sing different parts. We play different parts in the body of Christ. And our job is to do our respective parts such that we bless one another, such that we harmonize. And frankly, this is actually why we put such emphasis on 
music and singing. If you're newer to the community, you've no doubt noticed that some of the songs we sing are a bit more, what shall I say, complicated? There we were singing a fairly normal sounding song and then everyone just took off in their own directions. The Proverbs say that as a man thinks, so is he. And we think, you might just as easily say, as a man sings, so is he. In fact, that's almost exactly what Colossians goes on to say, just a couple verses down. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. How do we learn to harmonize as a community? Well, by learning to sing with grace. So that's what we're practicing here at this table as well. We are literally singing and harmonizing here at the table, but we're also sharing bread and wine as the body of Christ, picturing the harmony that we're seeking to grow into. And if you feel like you don't know the harmony yet, remember, the rule is, feel free to stick with the melody. And the melody of Christian community is Christ crucified for sinners. So come and welcome to Jesus Christ. On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and gave thanks. So let's give thanks together. Our God and Father, we praise you and thank you for Jesus Christ, who came to this earth, died for us, was raised from the dead, and ascended to your right hand. Father, we praise you and thank you for this glorious gospel and the gift it is to live together in community. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. And amen. You've heard this morning the good news, the gospel, that Jesus has ascended to the Father's right hand and he stands there in heaven, making all things clean for you. He, heaven and earth are not far off. Heaven and earth are close. They mingle, they touch, they break through. And in Christ, you've been brought all the way in, which means that all that you do, all that you do is now empowered by heaven. The angels are with you. The saints are cheering you on. And Christ, above all, is standing there. He's there for you. So go now to do whatever God has called you to do with his blessing on your heads. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, who has loved us and given us an everlasting consolation and good hope by his grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. And amen.